Good morning. We prepare the meaning, the morning for worship by lighting the Christ candle, remembering Christ is here among us and that the God of love gathers us here. Well, good morning. Well, 
before I tell you, or before we read our story today, <laughs> I need to know that you know what opposites are. Good morning. So let's start off. Okay, opposites. If we have, hmm, if we have down, what's the opposite of down? Can you show me? Oh, he's showing me. It's up, isn't it? All right, how about quiet? What's the opposite of quiet? What is it, Jake? Oh, it's quiet. Ah! It's ah! There you go, it's loud. And how about calm? What is the opposite of calm? Silly. <laughs> yeah, it's silly, isn't it? There you go. Well, we're going to be reading a story about, oh, I need this one. There you go. You got it, buddy. This is Jonah. Does Jonah look like a human? No. For our story, Jonah is a dog. Okay. But Jonah did the opposite of what God called him to. So go ahead. Let's go ahead and have a seat down here because I've got a big, big thing to show you here. Okay. So this comes from the book of Jonah. All right. So God told the prof prophet Jonah. Oh, Gabs, can I hold on to him? Oh, there we go. So here's the prophet Jonah. He says, go to Nineveh and tell the people that they are doing wrong. But listen, Jonah did the opposite. Instead, Jonah boarded a ship. Oh, can I have the ship? There we go. And here's Jonah right there. And he boarded the ship sailing to um, Tarshish and went below and fell asleep. That definitely sounds like the opposite of what God called him to, right? Then a big storm came up. And guess what? That ship went from sailing nicely to the opposite of sailing calmly, right? Kind of violent. And the captain said to Jonah, get up, pray. <laughs> Maybe your God will save us. The storm did not stop and the sailors were horrified. Jonah said, throw me into the sea. The storm is because of me. The sailors did not want to, but finally they picked Jonah up and they threw him into the sea. And guess what? The storm stopped. But God sent a giant fish and ate that swallowed Jonah. And Jonah stayed inside this big fish for three days. Can you show me how many three is? Yeah, three days. Can you imagine inside this big fish? So... Jonah, um, then he prayed to God. He says, thank you, God, for hearing me. I promise I will keep the promise to you. Then God told the fish to spit Jonah onto the land. Hey, Jake, can you spit Jonah onto the land up here? Perfect. Okay, so Jonah got back up onto the land. Now, God told Jonah, you need to go to a town called Nineveh. So, Nineveh is in the country of Assyria, and it's right here. So Jonah went to Nineveh here, and when the king, oh, sorry. And so he walked across Nineveh, crying out God's message, 40 more days and Nineveh will be destroyed. When the king, heard of Nineveh, when the king of Nineveh heard the news, he put on sackcloth. He sat in ashes and proclaimed, no one shall eat or drink anything. Everyone must wear sackcloth and cry out to God. We must turn away from evil and violence. May God forgive us. But here's Jonah. He's still yelling. God's coming in 40 days. But guess what? God saw what the people in Nineveh were doing, and he did not destroy the city. This made Jonah angry. <laughs> um. And so he said, God, I knew this would happen. That's why I did not want to come here. I know that you are gracious, loving, and forgiving. I cannot bear it. Jonah went out of the city. He sat there waiting to see what would happen next. God made a bush grow up uh, to, give, uh, to, jo to give Jonah shade. Jonah was happy about the bush. Um, but the next day, a worm attacked the bush and it died. The sun beat down. Jonah said, yes angry. Oh, excuse me. And Jonah said, I cannot bear this. God asked, is it right for you to be angry about the bush? 
Jonah said, yes, angry enough to die. God said, you care about the bush. Do you really think that I should not care about Nineveh? That city was, has many, many people who do not understand right and wrong, and also many animals. All right, so as we finish up our story this morning, Nineveh was a royal city um, in the Assyrian Empire, and God showed Jonah that God's love is so big, so big, that it even includes Jonah's worst enemy, the people who lived in Assyria. So as you leave today, I want you to think of this question. Who are the people that you can think of who are inside God's big circle of love? All right, let's head back to our seats. Let me, <clears throat> excuse me, let me explain, first of all, <clears throat> that I'm not trying to imitate George Blaurock and take over the pulpit in the 16th century. I, in fact, want to make a kingdom report, and I had requested this some weeks ago, and it got inadvertently left off the bulletin. In 19 days, a grand experiment will be launched at the state fairgrounds in Hutchinson, Kansas. Each of you can play a role in the success of that experiment. In fact, I would suggest that you may play a critical role in the success of that experiment. I'm speaking, of course, of the Kansas Mennonite Relief Sale, which will take place on July 2 and 3 at the state fairgrounds. <coughs> In many ways, it will be an unusual sale. It's occurring in July instead of April, thanks to COVID. There will be no plant sale. That took place back in April at the MCC Central States Building. The feeding of the multitude will consist of 2,500 Varenica and sausage meals for carryout, 1,500 on Friday night, 1,000 on Saturday. Meals, I might add, that will not, I repeat, not contain Bonabruggy <laughs> or borscht, though I plan to buy one anyway. There will be no inflatables for the children. So what will there be? According to the quilting experts in our congregation, there will be one of the finest quilt auctions ever, with 304 quilts, an extraordinary number of which have been quilted by hand. There will be an exceptionally fine collection of vehicles at auction, sports cars, vans, tractors, motorcycles, a restored 1926 Model T Ford, even John Esau's pristine 1998 GMC Sonoma pickup with only 35,000 miles. There will be a silent auction, a kid's auction, a memorabilia auction, quilter's corner, baked goods, and lots of ice cream for sale. So what's the experiment? With all these changes, with a pandemic not yet defeated, Will it still work? Will we raise the requisite funds to feed and house the hungry, displaced children in Gaza and the Congo? After all, July 2 to 3 are very likely to be busy days for farmers, and many of the Mennonite churches in South Central Kansas still have lots of farmers in their membership. There are still Mennonites and others who have not been vaccinated against COVID, and even some who have may be too fearful of crowds to attend. It will almost certainly be beastly hot, although the buildings will be air-conditioned, and a shuttle will be available to whisk you from one air-conditioned building to another. 
And with school out, many folks may be out of town on vacation. But why would I say that folks from BCMC might play a critical role in the success of this experiment? We have very few farmers in our congregation. We have lots of retirees in our congregation. We have virtually all been vaccinated. This is the year for us to step up to ensure the success of the experiment. How? There are sign-up sheets in the back for bread, pies, and sweebok, and there are still slots available. Some of you and your Sunday school classes have already contributed needed funds to underwrite the expenses of the sale, but there remains a desperate need, a desperate need for volunteers. Go to the website, kansas.mccsale.org, and click on the Volunteer tab. If you need help, contact Dennis or Kathy Campbell or Margot Schrag or yours truly, and we'll handle the technology for you. The children in Gaza and Congo are hungry and homeless. Let's do all we can to make sure this MCC experiment is successful. Thank you. This morning's scripture comes from Jonah 1, 1 through 16, from the New Revised Standard Version. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, saying, Go at once to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah set out to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid his fare and went on board to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and such a mighty storm came upon the sea that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried to his own God. They threw the cargo and with that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. Jonah, meanwhile, had gone down into the hold of the ship and had lain down and was fast asleep. The captain came to him and said to him, What are you doing sound asleep? Get up, call on your God. Perhaps the God will spare us a thought so that we do not perish. The sailors said to one another, Come. Let us cast lots so that we may know on whose account this calamity has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, Tell us why this calamity has come upon us. What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country, and what people are you? Uh, I am a Hebrew, he replied. I worship the Lord, the God of heaven who made the sea and dry land. Then the men were even more afraid and said to him, What is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of his Lord, because he had told them so. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you, that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea was growing more and more tempestuous. He said to them, Pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you, for I know it is because of me that this great storm has come upon you. Ne nevertheless, the men rowed hard to bring the ship back to land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more stormy against them. Then they cried out to the Lord, Please, O Lord, we pray, do not let us perish on account of this man's life. Do not make us guilty of innocent blood. For you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked Jonah up and threw him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord even more, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord 
and made vows. As a pastoral team, pastors Don, Nathan, and I decided to switch things up for the summer and do a few different book studies. This first one from the Old Testament was my idea, the book of Jonah. One of our pastors wondered aloud if we would actually be able to preach four weeks on this short book of Jonah. To which I then quickly responded with, well, of course, there are four chapters. (laughs) But thinking through the structure of the next four weeks, I quickly realized that maybe that pastor was right. How are we going to preach four different stories on this humorous short story? But one of the joys of having a pastoral team is that even though we all appear to agree on the general interpretation that the book of Jonah is a story and not historically accurate, and none of us actually want to be like Jonah, I do think that we will be hearing some very different sermons. Especially because this belief for me about and this sermon were developed before I read about the lobster man near Provincetown, Massachusetts, who was gulped in the mouth of a humpback whale yesterday and lived to tell about it. This man was spit out of the humpback whale's mouth after the whale unsuccessfully tried to swallow him. So I might need to revisit this interpretation for the rest of this month. But anyways, a guiding theme that may become apparent during the next four weeks is the reluctance of God's people. The reluctance shown here, especially through Jonah. Jonah was called to do a task that he did not want to do. And I think that we all have had some experience with that we are probably more like Jonah than we'd like to admit. While Jonah is one of the more famous stories in the Bible, do we actually want to be like Jonah? And do we want to be the one God calls us to do a difficult task? Do we want to respond like Jonah did? Or do we want the fame of Jonah? These are interesting questions that this recently ordained individual has spent some time reflecting on this week. But today, I will only be looking at the first three verses of chapter one, where God asks Jonah to do something, and Jonah decides to flee instead of following that request from God. Now, there is a lot of background information that comes with these three verses that I think is important for us to name. In the first verse, God tells Jonah to go to Nineveh and to rebuke them for their sin, to tell them to repent and change their ways. Now, at the time, Nineveh was the capital of the Assyrian Empire, and was a pretty big city for its time. I think it might be comparable to Washington, D.C. today. The second verse tells us that Jonah heard this call from God and decided to flee to Tarshish via boat so that he would not be in God's presence any longer and could escape from this call. Some believe that Jonah decided to flee because he was given a difficult job. Those people in living in Nineveh at the time were wicked and powerful. And Jonah was worried he would be mocked and harmed or killed even if he did this job that God called him to do. So I started thinking about Rachel Corey here. 
Rachel Corey was a peace activist who worked in Gaza almost 20 years ago. Corey felt called to go to Gaza and work alongside Palestinians as they tried to live their lives, attempting to find peace and justice. Corey was mocked and threatened and ultimately did die doing this work. Being an activist in the Holy Land has never been an easy job. But unlike Corey, Jonah decided to flee from this difficult task. And not only did he run away, he also chose the city at his time that was views, viewed as the place thought to be at the end of the earth. He went to the farthest place he could go to escape God's presence. But in this story, as we quickly watch as God called Jonah to do a difficult task, Jonah never actually verbally said no or argued with God. He didn't take the time to discern with his friends or to work up the courage to complete this difficult task. Instead, he just chose to run away from God without hesitation. So my focal point for this week, based on these three verses, is that like Jonah, we do not put our trust into God's hands. I think that we know we should, and in some ways we even know how to. Or maybe we partially put our trust into God's hands, or we say we are or will soon, and then we don't actually relinquish our control to let God work through us. So we know what happened to Jonah when he didn't relinquish control for God to work through him. But I wonder if we notice what happens in us when we don't allow God to work God's powerful love within us. Maybe we don't find ourselves in the actual belly of a fish, but do we metaphorically find ourselves in the belly of a fish? I had the realization this week that this fish belly living is indeed at play, at least in my life. I have transitional anxiety, and this anxiety flares up when the unknown is present, when I'm not sure what comes after graduation or what a move will look or feel like, what changes after I'm ordained, or what happens if every minute of a youth trip is not planned out. And this anxiety tends to set in at 3.30 in the morning. It's like clockwork, and I just happen to inherit it from one of my parents. If you know them, you can maybe guess which one it is. But my spiritual director this week is the one that actually helped me realize the connection between this anxiety and releasing my stress into God's hands. She asked me when I wake up at 3.30 in the morning if I know why. And I said, of course. It's that I start to, that the stress wakes me up and then I start to process it at that time because nothing else is going on in my brain. She then asked if I'm able to release those stresses and trust that God will help work it all out like in a true spiritual director fashion. But maybe God is not asking me to go to a powerful city and tell the people how sinful they are. And yet, I still tend to not release my troubles into God's hands very well. And my reasoning is because I like to have control. 
I like to plan how things will happen, when they will happen, if they will happen. And I do this because when I don't have control, I get scared that I will mess up and people will yell at me or I'll unintentionally hurt someone around me or that maybe I'll look like a fool if I don't know what's going on and others will laugh at me or that maybe I do the wrong thing because I didn't spend enough time fully processing what I should be doing and therefore I am a failure. So at 3.30 in the morning, I plan the unknown and try to grasp any semblance of control. So yes, I totally understand the fear and hesitation that Jonah has in releasing his trust into God's hands. Like him, I too am worried that if I release control of something, I might get hurt or I might be made fun of because I don't have it all under control. And it is an icky place to sit in, whether or not it's a physical belly of a fish or a metaphorical belly of a fish. Now today, my plan was not to wrap up the message of the book of Jonah. We do have three more weeks for that to come. Instead, today, I'd like to give us all a little homework assignment to do together for the next month. I think that we all would do well to focus this month on releasing what is out of our control so that when God calls us, we not only hear it, but we are also able to trust and let God to take the reins. So at the advice of my spiritual director, I have placed a card by my bedside that says, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So that when 3.30 a.m. rolls around each night, and I try to control the narrative. I allow space for God to speak the messages that need to be said, to process the messages that need to be discerned, and to release the stress so that rest will come. And I'd like to invite us all to find something that works uniquely to each one of you so that you too are able to practice releasing your trust into God's hands. Maybe it's a 10 minute silent meditation you do each day. Or maybe it's sitting outside each morning with your coffee listening. Maybe you, too, write down words or scripture verses to recite when you need to listen to what God is nudging you to hear. Or maybe you take five deep breaths each time anxiety makes your heart beat a little faster. Whatever it is when stress and anxiety start to bubble up inside of you, do your exercise. And I hope that we all notice what changes happen over the next month. I hope that we all are able to work together to allow space for God to be present with us. May it be so.
Now we pray. We come to you, God, a people who experience sunrises and sunsets, rain and drought, food and company, birthdays, weddings and funerals, graduations, recitals, promotions, and all the other transitions in life. We thank you for another trip to Menisca and the preparation that has gone into the youth's Alabama trip. We thank you and pray for continued protections. We are proud and prideful, full of confidence and hubris when we are running away for, for the metaphorical Tarshish. We are timid, weak, and full of self-doubt, quick with a flattering sacrifice and vow when we're desperate in a sinking ship. We know you are the God who made the sea and the dry land but we will complain bitterly when you just reward the undeserving Ninevite anyway. While we work to follow all the, the, the rules, it's not fair and it feels meaningless at times when we see no progress. Keep sending us the big fish and the superstitious sailors and Ninevites, plants and worms to teach us how the rain falls on the just and the unjust and that we must keep the exercise going without resorting to our personal Tarshish. We delight in your laws, O Lord, of physics and chemistry and medicine, but we also sometimes need and want a quick suspension of these wonderful and painful laws. We know you understand our plight as your son experienced human vulnerability and mortality. But this is our first and only time through this life, and we get scared, confused, and upset. Sometimes we join the sailors' observations. For you, O oh Lord, has done as it pleased you. Please have respect and patience for us as we grapple with our vulnerability and mortal plight. Help us as we have respect and patience with each other. Help us to help each other with, these, with this plight with our shared experiences. With that said, we specifically pray for Elizabeth Raid, who has been diagnosed recently with pancreatic cancer. Like others, she has been through a lot in a short amount of time. Be with Gary and the rest of the family as they work with physicians. Comfort her, be there, and help us to be there too. Be with the rest of the BCMC congregation and staff who represent a cross-section of your creation. Protect us, suspend, bend, and uphold your laws to bring us back seven rotations from now, safe and sound. Amen.
Lord, for your servants are working on trying to listen to your words better. Help us to open up space for your work to be done. Amen.